Hi all, and welcome to another episode of Sustaining Sustainability. My name is Chris Gassman. I'm the Senior Associate Director at the Center for Sustainable Business, and I am your host today. This week, I'm joined from Turtle Creek, Pennsylvania, by Joe Mastrangelo, the CEO at, of EOS Energy Storage, a leading manufacturer of scalable, efficient, and sustainable energy storage systems. Manufacturing their zinc-based battery has a lower carbon, water, and energy intensity compared to lithium-ion batteries and is designed to pair with renewable energy production. Joe has nearly 30 years of energy industry experience, including CEO at GE's power conversion business and gas power systems at GE Power. Joe, welcome to the show. Thanks, Chris. Great to be here. Really appreciate it. Yeah, pleasure to have you. So you've had a long career in energy. What about energy attracted you? How does moving into renewable energy tie in with your personal sense of purpose? Yeah, it's back a long way to when I when I when I <laughs> entered into energy, you know, three decades. Um, you know, I, I worked for G for General Electric for twenty five years and when I started out I, I wound up I was on a training program and wound up in Schenectady, New York. And my career in energy kind of organically grew out of that starting point, right? So when you go back back then, when you went to GE, the promise was, you know, you could move around to different businesses. So coming out of school, wasn't like I was sitting in university and saying, I, I want to be in the energy industry. But then as I started working in the industry, you start to realize the impact that you have on bringing and improving the quality of life of people, you know, in my 30 years you know, I've spent time in the oil and gas industry, and as you talked about, in power conversion and gas power systems, and really, um, you know, the the miracle of when you when you flip your light switch and everything works. There's so many things that goes into making that happen every day, and that's become a passion of mine to being able to do and being able to bring that to people. And then at the same time, you know, the areas where you're producing or installing equipment create you know careers for people and and allow people to get uh, to improve themselves and to find a career path in, in this industry that's so critical to how we live our lives every day. You're bringing it a, a little bit closer uh, in time. You know, when EOS went public in 2020, you, you told TD Ameritrade that EOS was committed to building capacity as you bring in orders to avoid some of the problems competitors in this space have experienced. So what challenge or what have been challenges and opportunities in this approach? Yeah. So, so, you know, what I've learned throughout my career is that, you know, you, you want to use, utilize your capital wisely, right. And how you invest mm -hmm. it and, and where, you know, any company at, at any point in their life cycle, where you wind up getting in the trouble is if you have excess capacity and you're out looking for orders. Now, the, the, the nice part about being in the energy storage business is there is a lot of pent up demand there, but you always have to prepare for that moment of, of, you know, what if the, what if something changes and the demand's not there and you don't want your company to be sitting there with a lot of excess capacity and fixed costs that cause it to struggle in, in downtimes and markets or, or, or in slow growth modes. You know, when you look at where we are right now as an industry, um, with the passage of the IRA legislation, which will be an accelerant for energy storage, you know there there's been a, kind of a slow um, a slow period of closing orders, not because the demand's not there, but because everybody is trying to figure out how the IRA will be implemented. And mm -hmm. if you had had a big factory sitting there with fixed costs, you probably would have wound up drowning the company on those costs while you're waiting for the volume to come in. Now, the challenge of being able to do this and getting to the core of your question, Chris, is that, you know, as you're doing this, you're always you're always running to, to keep up with your order book or with your backlog that you have to deliver for your customers. Um, you know, it's been a challenge. And I think that the bigger challenge to me, like when I look at what we're doing right now, and it's it's probably the biggest challenge I've faced in my 30 year career is when you start off with four empty walls, and that's what we started with in Turtle Creek, when you have four empty walls and you try to put a factory around that, and, and the hardware or the equipment part of it is probably the easy part. You also have to bring in the people and all the structures and processes. 
you know, it becomes a big challenge building from scratch. The proverbial blank sheet of paper is great until you realize the sheet of paper really is blank and you're building day by day. So, so what you find in a company like EOS is you go from the highest point of strategy and you know, how you position a company for the long term to sometimes being out on the shop floor and the factory floor with a broom sweeping the floor. That makes the job fun, but it also is a huge challenge as you try to scale a company. Sure. And so, Joe, you touched on this a few times there in as far as like the capacity, the people, right? Uh, so what does the future of green energy jobs look like? And you know, what will the impacts be on communities? Yeah, you know, I, I look at this as, you know, you want to you want to be able to create create careers in green tech and green energy, right? You, this isn't about, you know, a, a job is different than a career. You want people that right. can come in and grow and improve themselves and continue to progress over a, over a time period. I think I think in, in my time, um, this has this is a is a secular shift in the industry being driven by the needs. And it's, and it's not, I mean, this is about more renewables coming into the energy mix, but at the same time, it's about making what we have today more efficient and effective in the delivery of the power required for us to all live our lives. So when you look at this, I think you've got this kind of, you know, multiple career paths that you can come in at, like, you know, you've got, you know, people that can come in and help build the company from a technology standpoint and, and not just product technology, but also software and people that you can hire to create good hourly um, positions in factories where our philosophy of how we hire is we bring you in, you start off in the warehouse and you work your way up to supervisor roles. And, and one of our main supervisors, three years into our journey, you know, employee number two, is now a supervisor for one of our most important, um, you know, production lines in the factory, which is what we're trying to do. As you think about how you build a company for the long term. Very cool. Very cool. So, what led you know thinking about those communities? Uh, you know, what led EOS to prioritize local supply chains, and how is that helping you achieve your sustainability goals? Yeah, so it, it always starts off with economics drove the original decision. So when I joined the company five years ago, you know, I was used to working in a large company, global scale um, at GE and coming to a startup, the strategy that the company was contemplating at the time was looking at potentially manufacturing product in China, bringing it to the US and, you know, you know, necessity becomes the mother of invention or, or even implementation of strategy. So when we looked at that, what, what, you know, what, I, what I told the team at the time was to be able to manage a, a facility in China, which I had done in my time in GE, requires a lot of resources and a lot of time on the ground. You're not going to start something new and try to do that remotely. So that was point one in the decision process. The second piece was looking at the amount of time that we would be spending with material being shipped on, a, on, on the water became cost prohibitive. So we moved manufacturing to the U.S. to be able to bring and develop our manufacturing processes. Now, in the middle of doing that and what made good economic sense, it probably also saved the company in COVID because we had our manufacturing nearby. We had taken a supply base that when I joined the company was less than 50% in the U S and grew it to at the time to 60, 60%. So we were able to work locally to keep product flowing and keep building, uh, building um, uh, product and getting it out into the field to our customers. So save the company. And then as we started to look at this, it just became, you know, when you look at where we are today, logistics costs is one of your highest costs in manufacturing. So, being local lowered the logistics costs. It's important to be able to be with your key partners. I don't like to call them suppliers, but your key partners to have them nearby so that you can address and quickly react to changes in the marketplace and also changes in your production processes. 
So we started developing that. And then what we realized is, is as much as we like to say, like America has gotten away from manufacturing, there's a large manufacturing base and expertise that can bring product to market. And when we look at this, you know, we as a country have led, you know, at almost every phase of the energy development, except for when you look at really solar panels, right? So when we looked at this, we said this next phase of, of, of energy storage, we need to have a, American technology. So when you look at EOS, you know, it's a company where the technology was invented with American minds, it's built with American hands, using material that comes from the United States on manufacturing equipment that was built in the US. And it shows what we can do when you put together the minds and ingenuity of people and really come up with a clear strategy and develop it. It took us time to get there, but it's been a very satisfying journey for us and for myself personally. I love the uh, Made in USA story behind that. So uh, Joe, what, um, how does your focus on ESG and the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals you know, impact your conversations with customers and investors? You touched on this a little bit, but let's dig a little bit deeper. Yeah, you know, the company at its core, our, our core mission is aligned with with both ESG and also at least the the E part of it and and the UN piece of it. like we line up perfectly to that. On the you know when you look at the social aspect of this, you know um, Turtle Creek, you know when we look at where our factory is located. The factory is located where Westinghouse actually started. Like we're in the original facility of Westinghouse, which is also somewhat strange for a G alumni to be driving in the gates every day to what was once your biggest competitor. Um, but in that area, you know, you, you look at the people that we're hiring, you know, this is an area that um, hasn't had a lot of economic growth, needs job creation. Um, and on the social part, when you look at our workforce, our workforce today, it, it, it reflects the community where our factory is located. You know, we are 50% minority, 20% women, 20% U.S. veteran on our workforce, which is a great way for us to build a company. Now, the other piece of this, when you think about investing and talking to customers, every employee is a shareholder in the company from the janitor um, up to me. We all have stocks. So we all think and behave and act like owners. And when you talk to investors about what we're doing with our product and how we're doing it with the supply chain and where we're manufacturing, it fits perfectly in the goals. And it doesn't just stop there with kind of fitting in with standard standards or regulations. You, know, you also have the piece of this where our you know two other big selling points of our product are the safety of the product. So there's no inherent fire risk like you see with other technologies. And the product at the end of its useful life in 20 years, you know, we've got to think about the next generation, you know, in 20 years, um, you know, that product is fully recyclable using standard recycling processes. You don't need to build a smelter. You don't need to build um, a highly complex process. You can use what's out there today to recycle everything in our product. And in fact, you can take our electrolyte and bring it back to its original form and reuse it again. So this is a product from birth to rebirth is 100% sustainable. And I think people like that and are looking to invest in companies like ours. Love that. Well, on the, the note of cycling through things from birth to rebirth, uh, Joe, unfortunately, we are coming to the end of this part of the conversation. There will always be opportunities for follow-up conversations. One thing that we do ask all of our guests in, in closing is what call to action would you make to our listeners? Look, I, I think we're at a unique moment in time right now. And, and you know, what what excites me and, and, you know, gets me out of bed in the morning and putting in the hours that we put into building this company are really, you know, three things. And I think it's three things that we all should think about. You know, the first one is we're going to make the, the, the way the world powers itself greener. Right. Energy is always going to be a mix. Um, you're always going to have multiple technologies. And I think, you know, I think we all need to find our way to help and make that um, that energy mix cleaner and greener as we move forward for, future, as I said before, future generations. The second piece of this is 
you know, take on the challenge. You know, what we're doing has never been done before. It's exciting and at the same time tiring and it requires a lot of grit and you got to keep moving forward and incremental improvements day by day to do better. And then the third piece of this is what can you do to, to, to enrich people's lives and give them a career path, you know, a career path better, you know, to allow them to get further ahead in, in their goals and their dreams. You know, one of the most satisfying things for me leading the company is when I walk on the factory floor and somebody tells me about buying their first house or saving up the money to buy a new car and wanting to take me for a ride in their new car. When you can make that kind of impact, it seems small, but if all of us do that, when you make that kind of impact on people's lives, that's sustainable, that's special, and that's what's going to make the world better for the future. Brilliant. Love it. Three ways to drive a, a thriving world for all. Awesome. Well, Joe, thank you so much for joining us today. It has been a genuine pleasure. Thanks, Chris. Really appreciate the time and the opportunity. Yeah. Thank you all. Take care. And before we sign off, my name is Kristen P. Ahern, and I'm the producer and editor of Sustaining Sustainability. Let us know your thoughts in our podcast survey. Go to bit.ly slash CSB pod survey, all lowercase, all one word. The link is also in the show notes. This podcast is made by the Center for Sustainable Business at the University of Pittsburgh, directed by C.B. Bhattacharya. It is made possible by all our member companies. To learn more about our upcoming programs or about becoming a member, please go to our website or follow us at PittCSB on all social platforms. And if you liked this episode, please share it with a friend or colleague, since word of mouth is the best way for us to grow. And we'll see you soon for another episode of Sustaining Sustainability.